nation builder. Let us pray. <clears throat> my God, I stretch my hands to thee. No other help I know. If you withdraw your hand from me, I don't know where I go. And now in the name of the creator of the Christ and the Holy Spirit, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart and the hearts of all those gathered here, may it all be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer, as we together consider the message, God, the real nation builder. For we ask it in Jesus' name, we all said amen. amen. Advent, beloved Advent. Advent, we're reminded, is the way the church of Jesus Christ, wherever we are, all around the world, prepares for Christmas. Since sometime in the late 5th or early 6th century this season, the, verse, the very first season on the Christian calendar has been a time to recall the meaning of Christmas. The word Advent is the Latin form of Adventus, and it means coming. Christians the world over use this opportunity to both recall Jesus coming to earth as a babe in Bethlehem and to prepare ourselves for his promised return to earth in the second coming. Somebody in here say the second coming. In a world where so much focus is placed on gift giving, card sending, and party attending. The season of Advent itself is a precious gift. Its purpose is to help us remember the story of a peasant girl who gave birth in a stable to a child whose life, death, and resurrection would change the world. Yes. Oh, how we love that song whose lyrics say, Jesus, Jesus, oh, what a wonderful child. Jesus, Jesus, so holy, meek and mild. New life, new hope, new joy he brings. Listen to the angels sing. Holy, holy, holy to the newborn king. One more time through. Here we go. And Jesus, yeah, Jesus, yes. Oh, what a wonderful child. Jesus, yes, Jesus. So holy, lowly, meek and mild New life, new hope, new joy he brings Listen to the angels sing Holy, holy, holy to the newborn king Amen. Thank you, Cephas. Let the church say amen. As we prepare for Christmas, beloved, the Bible's prophets lay out the way we prepare. They bring tidings of the Messiah whom we're preparing for. They set the table. Oh, isn't it wonderful when somebody can set a beautiful table even before you start eating, you are, you are delighted by the table setting before you. Amen. The prophets warm up the room for Jesus. They chart the direction towards the stable. The prophet Micah, Micah, yes, identified himself by his hometown called Moraseth Gath, which sat near the border of Philistia and Judah, about 25 miles southwest of Jerusalem dwelling in a largely agricultural part of the country, Micah lived outside the governmental centers of power in his nation, leading to his strong concern for the lowly and less fortunate 
of society. He was concerned with the lame, the outcasts, and the afflicted. Therefore, Micah directed much of his prophecy towards powerful leaders of Samaria and Jerusalem, the capital cities of Israel and Judah, respectively. You ask Silka about it in adult Sunday school class. She'll confirm it for you folks. Amen. When we hear Micah's most repeated declaration, it is worthwhile to remember his message was most often directed towards those already feeling a little bit left out with the recognition that in God's economy, no one is too small. In God's economy, no one is forgotten. No one is left behind. This knowledge infuses Micah's so-called mandate of chapter six and eight. Oh, you remember it. And what does the Lord our God require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with our God. I love the way the contemporary English version of the Holy Bible renders it. It says the Lord has told us what is right and what he demands. See that justice is done. Let mercy be your first concern and humbly obey your God. It is Micah with his plain spoken and easily understood message that we must remember as we hear the contours and challenges of our passage this morning. In the musical, the classic American musical, South Pacific. Raise your hand if y'all remember the musical South Pacific in here. Amen. We'll have more of you that remember it at this service than next service. Is that all right? <laughs> In that musical, Lieutenant Cable sings, you've got to be taught to hate and fear. You've got to be taught from year to year. And it's got to be drummed in your dear little ear. You've got to be carefully taught. Oh, the idea that we are naturally peaceful people, but we are taught hostility by others. Supposedly, if you leave us alone, we are sweet innocents whom others corrupt with hateful teachings. We might wish that were not so, beloved, but both history and theology teach us that it's not true. Ever since Cain rose up against Abel, we have known that hostility, self-justification, and pride are what we do too often. Ever since Lot argued with Abraham, ever since Sarah sent Hagar into the wilderness, we have known that all too often what is native or what seems native to us is not harmony, but hatred. And that means we have to be carefully taught, all right. But it's not that somebody has to teach us how to fight. Instead, somebody has to teach us the way of peace. Somebody has to teach us the ways to reconcile. Rodney King's famous statement, plain spoken as it was, why can't we all just get along? Beloved, we've learned that that's not going to happen all by itself, is it? But we can be carefully taught the ways of peace. We can be carefully taught how to love. We can be carefully taught what reconciliation is all about. Oh, the prophet Micah had a vision about that. In his mind's eye, he saw a place to which all nations, a, a future place, a place we have not yet reached, a place where all nations might go and, and ask 
and ask to be taught the arts of peace. In the days to come, he says, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established. Peoples shall stream to it and many nations, everybody here say many nations, many nations shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction. He shall judge between many peoples and shall arbitrate between strong nations far away. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. What a vision that is from the prophet Micah. That to the house of the Lord, all peoples would come to learn not war, but the art of peace. That to the people of God, the nations might come to find out how to move from unending hostility to eternal peace. What a vision. And when scripture here says all peoples would come to Mount Zion, we know a little more about God's agenda in sending the Messiah, Jesus Christ, into the world. God's agenda was truly nation building. Jewish and non-Jewish people coming together, learning the ways of peace fellowshipping together, seeking the kind of harmony that is so elusive in our tribal seeking world. My friend, Gate McConan, who is the, the, the executive director of, of Far Northeast Denver Housing Center, is a native Ethiopian. He was home and he said the shame of it, Reverend, As he came back from Ethiopia on this past trip, the shame of things, Reverend, is that in my part of the world, in in my country where, where Christianity predated the Romans taking over our country, in my part of the world, Christians and Jews and Muslims have been living together in peace for generations. Why can't we do that here? But some will say this nation building was all right for the small town country prophet Micah. The the vision he has of beating swords into plowshares and studying war no more was a great message to lift the lowly to whom Micah primarily preached. But if we add to that, beloved, this monument that you see, you can find when you travel to New York City the next time, if you go to the United Nations building, it it sits in the front courtyard it gives utterance to that which gathers nations together inside the building. Why? Because the big time prophet, the big city prophet, Isaiah, is in the mix of Advent and Christmas too, isn't he? Isaiah prophesied, though, in similar fashion to Micah. How similar, Pastor? Thank y'all for asking. For the second chapter of Isaiah brings us these, these nearly the same lines as Micah. 
and he shall judge among the nations, the Lord our God, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. There he will teach his ways, our God will, and, and we will walk in his paths, for the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And these two great prophets of the Holy Bible, these two outstanding restorers of hope, one city and one country, both of them preaching truth to power from the same song book. Oh, beloved, we all are guilty at some point in our lives of trying to figure out in society what country folk and and how country folk are different than city folk. And he wore a pair of shoes that we don't wear in the city. Oh, isn't that funny? And they wore a kind of hat we don't wear in the city. And this and that, we, we try to figure each other out. But see, this dichotomy we make is not a real dichotomy at all because city and country live in most all of us. We have it both in our ancestry. Not all of us were in the big city all our lives. <laughs> Not all our generations that went before us were in the big city. Were they, Julia? Come on, somebody. We were the utterance of, of those old folk tales about the country mouse and the city mouse. All of us, it's inside us. Beloved, these two great prophets and restorers of hope knew God. Our God, creator, Redeemer and sustainer as the real nation builder. The one who would bring peace for all time and beyond time. The one who would stand at the bookends of history's beginning and end. Our God always drawing us together. Our God always building onto the vision we already have. Our God pushing and prodding as we wait expectantly for the return of our Savior, Christ Jesus. Our God, for whom we give thanks, like the little boy who was thanking God at Thanksgiving in his grace. And thank God for the turkey and the dressing. Thank God for the potatoes and the gravy. Thank God for even the pie and the whipped cream, but stopped in the middle of his grace and quietly whispered to his mommy, mommy, if I say that I'm thankful for the broccoli, will God know I'm lying? Hey, somebody here can thank God for that broccoli, the little boy's taste buds hadn't yet developed to appreciate. Somebody here can thank God because you know as cooks and those who love good food that we can thank God for lemon pepper now. Sprinkle a little on that broccoli, amen. Or we can go like Julia Child because butter makes everything better. Come on somebody, amen, right? Right? We can handle broccoli now, amen. Not like the little boy. Amen. This second Sunday of Advent, we thank God mightily for showing us again in this season. God is there. Oh, beloved, God is there. In spite of Capitol Hill hearings that depress us, God is there. In spite of Twitter feeds that startle us, God, beloved, the nation builder is still here wherever you look. There in the eye of every crazy bird you see, there is God. There is God in every song you hear. There is God squinting at you whenever the wind blows. There is God wherever the light shines, whenever a baby cries or a child laughs or a woman dances or a man sweats, there is God. God is looking at you, beloved, claiming your compassion, demanding your response 
wants wherever a family hungers or a creature is oppressed or brutalized by war or threat of war by poverty or prejudice by injustice or otherwise downcast dejected situation still God is there looking at you beloved wherever beauty is done God is there wherever truth is told God is there hallelujah wherever lovers whisper God is there I want to close with a a local thing that has taken place within the last four or five months. It's been kind of shocking to your pastor, the golfer. There's no longer a Fitzsimmons golf course. Among the many things I loved about Fitzsimmons was there was the legend of the President Eisenhower tree out on one of the holes. I hit that tree sometimes, Bill. Amen. Didn't mean to. Didn't want to, but it sat right in the middle of the fairway. Golfers will understand what I'm talking about. Amen. I'm sorry to leave the other nine golfers out. Amen. But every now and then, beyond party affi- affiliation or or things that, that seem to divide us when it comes to our beliefs about uh, who, who says what or does what, and belongs to which party or what. When President Eisenhower died, his family decided that something should stand for his legacy. And so when you visit his grave above, above the tomb, all there's other monuments that you must see that, that have some other sayings on it. But the one that draws my eye is the one the family thought his legacy speaks the loudest of. It was his 1953 speech called A Chance for Peace. This is what it says. Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fire, signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, a theft from those who are cold and are not clothed. I close with the details of the speech that were included in it. He said this world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. He said the cost of one modern heavy bomber is this, a modern brick school in more than 30 cities in 1953, beloved. It is two electric power plants, each serving a town of 60,000 in population. It is two fine, fully equipped hospitals. It is some 50 miles of concrete highway. We pay for a single fighter with a half million bushels of wheat. We pay for a single destroyer with new homes that could have housed more than 8,000 people. This from the Allied commander of troops of World War II, a former person who had made his reputation as a man of war embracing ways of peace finally and for all time. All nations must learn the words of the prophets and not just their words, beloved. We must learn to walk this way and beat our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks for the sake 
of our God. Who no matter what the diversity is you may name, is still intent on building us all into one nation. All God's people from everywhere. The ones most despised by some. Yes, these beloved ones too. One nation. May that same God that we know in Jesus Christ renew, restore, and reclaim us in this holy season of Advent. Let us pray. Oh Lord our God, we thank you for your vision is always bigger than ours. The hope you instill is abundant. It's available even in the darkest of times. Even when we think, oh God, our energy is totally gone, you still are there to lift us up. Thank you, precious God for who you are, and thank you, loving God, that we are yours. Make us one nation. If we have to wait till Zion, let us have the patience to wait. But we'll welcome your nation building even right now. In Jesus' sweet, precious, marvelous, and holy name we pray. And I heard the church say, amen, amen, and amen.